Greetings, everyone, and welcome to episode number nine of the Pan Future Society podcast. I am your host, Sean, and today is Saturday, July 16th, 2016. So I have recently been re-watching the television show Babylon 5. Uh, if you saw it in its original run, the pilot uh, was shown, I think, in February of 1993, and the regular show uh, started about a year later. So uh, in its original run, it won quite a few awards, and it was a bit groundbreaking uh, for its use of CGI. It was... Uh, I think the first show that did all of its effects with CGI, all of its spaceships and planets and space stations were all done in computers. And the effects do look a little bit dated, uh, but it was actually pretty advanced for the time, and it's not uh, irritatingly dated. At least it looks consistent, uh, unlike, in my opinion, George Lucas's slapping of modern effects into 30-year-old movies. Uh, at any rate, one of the early episodes, I believe episode three, at the end of the episode, Commander Sinclair is giving an interview. And in the interview, um, as in quite a few other moments in this show, there is some pretty weighty uh, dialogue. In this interview, he is asked uh, whether it's worth it to be out in space taking the risk uh, that humanity is in living on a space station and trying to figure out how to cooperate with other alien species and that sort of thing. His response is, however long it takes for our sun to die out, a thousand years, a hundred thousand, a million, if mankind does not move to the stars at some point, all of this will have been for nothing. He mentions uh, Marilyn Monroe, the Dalai Lama, Lao Tzu, some famous humans from history. And yes, it's a bit of a creative license to say uh, how long the sun dies out. But the point is, uh, eventually, Earth will be uninhabitable. And I wonder if, going back to 1994, when I watched this, if, if this statement stuck in my head subconsciously, and is one of the things that drove me to do this podcast, um, because that is one of the main reasons I think about these things, why I want to talk about them, and why I think people in general do not talk about them enough. Again, however long it takes for our sun to die out, a thousand years, a hundred thousand, a million, if mankind does not move to the stars at some point, all of this will have been for nothing. Your uh, heavy thought for the day there. Now on to your news of the moment. In this week's news, I've seen an article about a company that is making masonry bricks uh, uh, with a biological process. The company called Biomason was founded in 2012 by Ginger Krieg Dossier and it was a, bio, a biotechnology startup manufacturing company that uses a natural process to build cement based bricks. Uh, from their website, the formal inception of Biomason began as a response to an overwhelming positive reaction after winning an international design award, Next Generation, The Big Fix, by Metropolis Magazine. Submissions for the award was a proposal for a brick that was grown in contrast to being fired. The idea to grow bricks emerged from a study of coral structure, a very hard cementitious material created by nature in an ambient sea temperature with low energy and material inputs. The process has since been refined and continually optimized for increased performance and reduced production costs. An estimated 1.23 trillion bricks are manufactured e every year, resulting in approximately 800 million tons of carbon emissions, 
due to the fossil fuels required for firing uh, these bricks. 40% uh, of global carbon dioxide emissions are linked to the construction industry, uh, mostly to the production and disposal of construction materials. So these bricks are grown, they say, similar to a hydroponic process where units are mixed with the microorganisms and they're fed a solution to harden the bricks to whatever specification uh, you need for these different types of bricks. Some of the other uh, details and benefits. These bricks are made in ambient temperatures. Uh, if you know anything, if you've ever dealt with cement in normal conditions to make it, or if you're pouring it and you expect it to harden, it can't be too cold, it can't be too wet. Uh, this process apparently doesn't really matter. There are no CO2 emissions and there are minimal dependency on fossil fuels. Uh, they can be made on site, on your construction site, so you eliminate the transportation of materials as well. There's no waste. Uh, the products can be customized in various ways depending on whatever you need them to do. Uh, you can also uh, add other materials to make the bricks more insulating. And the materials used in the process are all from natural renewable resources, but can also come from waste products as well. So this seems like a win-win uh, all around. So biomason, making, uh, growing, I should say, bricks with microorganisms. And that is your news at the moment. All right, in the main segment this week, following on from last week's episode, I want to cover some of the work currently being done with brain-computer chip interfaces. Once the stuff of science fiction, there are a number of examples in use now that may lead to better treatments for Alzheimer's, stroke, paralysis, and other conditions. Neuroprosthetics, commonly in use now, include electrodes to stimulate the vagus nerve or deep brain stimulation used to treat clinical depression and Parkinson's disease. Other devices that allow for improvement or restoration of hearing and sight have been in use for some time. The first cochlear implant for hearing was done in 1957. The direct interface of chips to the brain is more complicated, but is not impossible. There are devices now that allow people to control prosthetic limbs, and even their own limbs, and research is being done to analyze and understand the complex way the brain stores memories. There are proposed chips that are quote-unquote five to ten years away, which is almost comically sometimes code for never, uh, but even if some of the tech never comes through, uh, we are gaining a much greater understanding of the brain and how it works. Perhaps in the far future, we will be able to download skills directly, matrix style, into our brains for everyday use, or maybe even have internal devices akin to Google Glass recording the events throughout our days. The transhumanist in me can't wait. DARPA, the uh, research arm of the military, is working on several projects. Chips that would allow soldiers to communicate on the battlefield or interface with an exoskeleton are planned for the long term, and chips that help with PTSD and memory in veterans are undergoing limited testing. The tests are in a very early phase just to examine the feasibility of implanting chips permanently in the brain. A Berkeley lab uh, also has a lab dedicated to improving the way machines interpret the commands from the users, uh, whether those are from a brain chip or other interface as people learn to use uh, prosthetic limbs or that kind of a thing. At UC Southern California and Wake Forest, teams are studying the way that memories are formed and how neurons interact with each other. 
They believe it could be possible to bridge brain damage with electronics and to allow the flow of signals from one neuron to another to be restored or to bypass damaged areas. Rat and monkey experiments have shown certain brain functions can be replaced by electrodes, and they expect small-scale human trials in two years. Uh, of this project, biomedical engineer and neuroscientist Theodore Berger said, quote, They record a memory being made in an undamaged area of the brain, then use that data to predict what a damaged area downstream should be doing. Electrodes are then used to stimulate the damaged area to replicate the action of the undamaged cells, end quote. This could not only help repair lost brain function, but could also potentially store memories. Scientists at Ohio State University implanted a chip into the brain of Ian Burkhart, paralyzed from the shoulders down two years ago. He is now able to move his own arm with his thoughts. This is the first time a person has moved their own limb with this kind of technology. There has been previous primate and human work controlling robotic limbs this way. Uh, using an fMRI, a functional magnetic resonance imager, a researcher scanned his brain while he tried to mirror videos of hand movements. Machine learning algorithms, artificial intelligence, were able to interpret those brain impulses after a time and translate the thoughts to a sleeve that stimulates the muscles in Burkhardt's arm. So he thinks of the same movement over and over, and the computer learns what his intention is and moves the muscles accordingly. For the moment, this system is cumbersome, hooked up to an external computer. Hopefully the tech can at least be brought down to the size of a backpack or something more portable. Another hurdle for this technology now is the time that it takes the computer to learn the intentions of the user, whether controlling a prosthesis or a real limb, and this particular device has to be recalibrated every day that Burkhardt hooks up to it. Uh, also, he can't feel what his hand is touching, but there is a video of him playing uh, Guitar Hero on the Nature article that I will link to in the show notes. I think that is beyond remarkable to see him using it. I'm sure the, the program has been modified, uh, but he's pushing buttons with a paralyzed arm just by thinking about it. So this isn't just a little bit of, oh, he could move his hand a little bit or lift his arm up. He is actually doing some fairly complex, nuanced control over his hand. Now, it's taken years to get to this point, um, but that is really some incredible technology. There are some other, other articles on nature uh, about brain chips worth reading, going all the way back to 2004. I think this is an interesting aspect of technological development, one that Ray Kurzweil would call exponential. Brain implants have been used uh, for over 10 years in some way in this sort of area of research, but they aren't commonplace. Someday, maybe soon, a materials breakthrough or something will push this technology rapidly forward where we'll see it go from decades of research in a few people to common treatment in just a few years. And there's a lot of tech that developed like that. Every time I research a show, I'm surprised how far back some of the ideas and early attempts actually go. It's a reminder to take the long view. For much of human history, people dreamed of flying. The first hot air balloon flight took place in France in 1783. Controversies aside, the Wright brothers made the first powered flight 120 years later in 1903. But only 58 years after that, Yuri Gagarin flew to space on a rocket and we made it to the moon only eight years later. That is a great example of exponential growth in technology. True, some of the fringier ideas never make it out of incubation, 
but I'm going to uh, never say never when it comes to technology. Alright everyone, that is your show for the week. This was episode number nine. Thank you so much for joining me as always. I am still your host, Sean. Last time I checked, and I probably will be again next week. If you're tired of me, uh, we could listen to you instead. If anyone out there is interested in being on the show, just get in touch with me or uh, let me know what you're interested in talking about or researching, and you could even just uh, record something on your phone and send it to me, and I can put you on the show. I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at uh, sean at panfuture.org, O-R-G. Uh, come find us online at panfuture.org, and from there you can link to our Facebook and Twitter accounts. Check out what we're doing, the blog. There's a blog there. I occasionally post uh, news in between shows. You can find the show archive. There is also a donate button there if you would like to help out with the show. I'm doing this because I love doing it. If you're enjoying it too, uh, and you want to get involved by throwing me some money, I will not say no to that. I would really appreciate it. And uh, you can also uh, check out my links to my music there as well. In fact, uh, one of my band projects just released a new EP of acoustic progressive rock music, so I'm going to tag one of those songs on the end of this show. I hope you enjoy. And I will talk to you again in the future.